Uh, good morning all. Um, welcome to this show and tell session. Um, we will be covering it today. Can we just flick over to the agenda? Um, so today we will have uh, presentations from electrolyzer improvements driven by waste heat recovery, um, Calfactor Energy, uh, Retrometer and Proportional Investment of Networks in Energy Efficiency Retrofit. Uh, so the theme for today is improving um, system efficiency. So all of these projects are from different areas of the system, but they're looking to sort of work, work together to drive efficiency. Um, so without further ado, I will um, hand over. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, are you handing over to me? Is, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so if we could just move on to the next slide, I think there's just a title slide. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so morning, everyone. My name's Matt Hammond. I work in the innovation team at National Gas Transmission. So I'll be talking about our uh, electrolyzer efficiency improvements driven by waste heat recovery innovation project. Uh, next slide, please. So National Gas own and operate the National Transmission System, which is the UK's high pressure natural gas network. The NTS is made up of over seven and a half thousand kilometers of high pressure pipeline, uh, bringing natural gas on shore and transporting it across the country. Uh, we supply natural gas to power industry and to the distribution networks who in turn supply industry homes and businesses. So we utilize compression on the NTS uh, to boost pressures and flows on the network to essentially meet demand and also build line pack, which is our method of sort of storing gas in the pipelines, um, just to build in some added flexibility. Uh, we use over 70 compressor units across 24 sites uh, strategically placed around the country. Uh, next slide, please. So most of our compressor units are driven by gas turbines. Um, so currently we take natural gas from the network itself to use as a fuel gas in these gas turbines, um, which drive the compressors. Um, and this means they produce carbon dioxide. So we have 70 of these units, therefore they're a very big uh, emitter of emissions on the NTS today. Um, so we're doing a lot of work uh, in, to see how we can decarbonize these assets. The turbines also produce waste heat, um, which is currently just lost to the atmosphere. Um, previously, we've run a number of feasibility studies which have shown that it's viable to fuel our turbines with hydrogen blends and 100% hydrogen instead of natural gas to reduce emissions. Uh, and we see the largest reduction in emissions coming from using, obviously, 100% hydrogen um, generated from electrolysis using green electricity. Um, so we expect that green electricity generation will be intermittent uh, due to things like uh, wind not, not blowing all the time. Um, therefore, we need to maximize the efficiency of hydrogen production uh, when there is green uh, electricity generation. So in this discovery phase project, we've investigated the feasibility of capturing the waste heat from the gas turbine exhaust and feeding this into an electrolyzer to increase the uh, efficiency of hydrogen production. Um, also, we've looked into different options for reducing and or capturing emissions from the system uh, as well. Um, next slide, please. So this, this project is focused on um, solid oxide electrolyzers, um, which are essentially an alternative to more traditional and more established uh, proton exchange membrane or PEM uh, and alkaline electrolyzers um, with higher efficiencies. Um, and these electrolyzers, electrolyzers run at higher temperatures and require steam as the input instead of just uh, water at ambient temperatures. So we've looked at the feasibility of capturing the waste heat from the exhaust, uh, feeling this as steam, uh, directly into the electrolyzer to improve the overall production uh, efficiency of the hydrogen production. Uh, and then we also want to feed the hydrogen that we produce into our gas turbines uh, to reduce emissions from the system. Um, in terms of emissions capture, um, we've looked at the sort of general options in this discovery phase for capturing or reducing and capturing CO2 and also NOx as well uh, to reduce the environmental impact of operating our compressor stations. Next slide, please. So we have a number of partners supporting on this project. So National Gas Transmission, we're the lead network on the project, and we obviously own and operate uh, the assets that we're going to focus on. 
um, Alpha Laval are experts in heat exchangers and waste heat recovery. Uh, therefore, naturally, they're looking into the waste heat recovery unit. Serra's Power own a uh, solid oxide fuel cell and are now looking to develop the solid oxide electrolyzer cell. Um, we're working with the Gas Turbine Research Centre at Cardiff University. They're looking into the emissions reductions and capture solutions for us and also carrying out a peer review exercise and crit critiquing the project approach. Um, Hydrogenus are involved with the development of low carbon hydrogen hubs in the UK. Uh, so they're sort of focusing on where the sort of wider impact and wider application of, of our hydrogen production uh, system. UK Power Networks are an electricity distributor and are looking at the potential uh, electricity connections required for the electrolyzer. And similarly, Anglian Water are looking at the water supply and treatment requirements for the system. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at some of the general system requirements and the use case development, um, we know from previous work that most of our turbines can be repurposed to run on hydrogen blends and up to 100% hydrogen as the fuel gas, uh, which means we're not really limited in terms of the rollout of the solution. It can be sort of rolled out across the network, which is, which is good. Uh, the one thing that does vary from site to site uh, is the utilization of the turbine. So some of our, our compressors are required um, more than others. So up in Scotland, the compressors are running much, much more uh, compared to, say, the southeast, where there's a bit of a variation and some of the compressors are not utilised that much uh, across the year. Um, we know uh, we mentioned that um, green electricity generation may not be uh, aligned with the demand from our turbines. Uh, therefore, some kind of hydrogen storage uh, will likely be required uh, on the system just to provide that sort of buffer and uh, so we have the hydrogen for when we actually need to use it. And the final point there is, is on the water and electricity connections. Um, so this, again, will vary from site to site. Each site is very different. A lot of our sites are quite remote, which means um, new utilities connections uh, could be quite costly, um, especially if the electrolyzer is going to require lots of uh, high, high capacity uh, connections. So next slide, and I'll now hand over to Richard at Alpha Laval to talk through the waste heat recovery system. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I'm Richard Price. Uh, I work for the power business unit of Alpha Laval, concentrating on waste heat recovery. So waste heat recovery on gas turbines um, is very common um, and is uh, applied regularly on combined cycle and combined heat and power applications. For well, this study, we took a typical uh, Siemens uh, gas turbine driven compressor, um, which is reasonably common um, around the uh, 70 compressor um, drives at the 24 sites that uh, national gas transmission have. And without waste heat recovery, the exhaust temperature from these gas turbines is in the region of 480 to 550 degrees centigrade, so considerable heat to be recovered. We looked at five fuel cases, 100% um, natural gas as a fuel to the gas turbine, which is the uh, current way of operating. Then we looked at three hydrogen blends with natural gas um, of varying proportions. And we also looked at 100% hydrogen case uh, if the gas turbine was operated solely on hydrogen as a fuel. We also considered two typical operating um, loads for these uh, compressors being an average and, and a maximum case. The emissions capture part is uh, somewhat temperature dependent. So for NOx reduction, the uh, prefers a higher temperature. Um, so that NOx, redu NOx reduction um, emissions capture would take place between a gas turbine and the waste heat boiler. Whereas um, for carbon capture, they prefer a lower temperature. So that would uh, most probably be after the waste heat recovery boiler. The partner in the project, Sarah, is uh, responsible for the electrolyzer, um, have a preference for a steam to be supplied at nine bar gauge and 200 degrees centigrade. So this was a delivery condition to be uh, considered for the waste heat recovery boiler. And as we have no um, hot water or condensate return, then the whole supply has to come from um, a new supply being cold ambient uh, temperature. Next slide, please. So for the cases I've described, the Alpha Laval type WHRGT was sized, which gave a final exhaust temperature um, around 137 to 142 degrees centigrade. So removing or recovering 
um, around over 400 degrees centigrade um, of heat. For the average case, this equated to 10.6 megawatts of thermal energy, which converts to 12.7 tons an hour of superheated steam. And because we're now recovering this heat and making it usable, it increase, increases the efficiency by around 50% from 28% to 78%. Similarly, for the peak um, load case, the maximum load case, 17.3 uh, megawatts of recovered thermal energy is available, um, which would generate uh, 22.4 tons an hour of steam for delivery to the electrolyzer. And this again increases plant efficiency uh, by around 50%. So this free energy recovery can be available from all the other NTS compressor stations, um, as I said, very common on gas turbines. The next phase hopefully um, would be the alpha phase, which would include for us site surveys, hazard and risk assessments, and the detailed boiler design and system design, as well as uh, project schedule and hopefully cost planning for the, for the beta phase demonstrator. Okay, next slide, that's for me, I think. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Stefan Otomega. I'm um, system applications lead uh, for SOEC at uh, uh, CERES, and I will present you uh, the uh, solid oxide electrolyzer from uh, CERES. The integration of uh, solid oxide electrolyzer with downstream um, waste heat from gas turbine provides um, the opportunity to maximize the value uh, from the uh, solid oxide electrolyzer. Uh, so, uh, Ceres solid oxide electrolyzer can offer the high efficiency, also having the ability to uh, load hollow uh, from uh, uh, heat supply, waste heat supply, or uh, power supply. Um, heat integration with um, the, the gas uh, turbine enables um, um, the, the heat to uh, uh, make um, steam from uh, water evaporation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Solid oxide electrolyzer technology uh, platform provides the most efficient um, electrolyzers, uh, electrolysis route uh, to, to hydrogen. And um, uh, the uh, uh, Ceres um, the solid oxide cell running at um, uh, lower temperature, uh, around 500, 600 degrees Celsius compared to uh, the high temperature solid oxide cells like um, uh, 700 or 850 degrees Celsius. Um, th this um, 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 offer a, a ideal solution for heat integration with um, uh, other downstream processes where uh, waste heat uh, is, is available. Um, solid oxide uh, electrolyzer technology platform has the unique ability to utilize heat in lieu of some electric power. Uh, which is necessary uh, to, to split the um, uh, water molecule. The opportunity to maximize the value from uh, solid oxide electrolyzer comes from the integration with uh, these uh, downstream processes and plant, uh, providing uh, the potential to uh, saving up to uh, eight kilowatts uh, um, uh, hour per kilogram of hydrogen produced. Um, we, um, a look at um, the uh, heat, waste heat available and uh, how much uh, uh, steam can be produced uh, at uh, 200 degrees uh, Celsius and 9 bar. These are not uh, uh, hard uh, limits. Um, uh, actually, uh, the, the hard limit is only to, to get uh, superheated steam. Um, and um, uh, we, we sized the electrolyzer accordingly, and we, we got um, um, a production of uh, around 31 uh, uh, kilogram uh, per hour of uh, hydrogen at 99.99% uh, purity. And um, the consumption is uh, around 1.25 uh, uh, megawatts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, we run um, uh, some calculations for this um, uh, uh, level of uh, hydrogen production. 
and compared um, um, solid oxide um, electrolyzer from Ceres with um, uh, low temperature electrolyzers, uh, which uh, are not able to uh, take the advantage of um, waste heat. And uh, we um, um, seen that uh, the levelized cost of hydrogen uh, in, in for uh, Ceres solid oxide electrolyzer is about 25, 26% lower. Um, the uh, Ceres um, uh, solid oxide electrolyzer could be saving more than 6% on, on CapEx. This is because uh, um, it's um, um, uh, the, the uh, size of the electrolyzer, it's uh, smaller. Um, and the nameplate, it's about 30% uh, uh, lower compared to low temperature electrolyzer. Um, also, we have uh, seen that um, uh, the uh, SOEC is consuming uh, electricity uh, and the cost is about 30% uh, uh, lower compared to the uh, electricity consumed by low temperature electrolyzers. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Pugh from Cardiff. As Matthew mentioned, our responsibility in this project was to look at the emissions that were being produced from a gas turbine. So with an SGT400 like this, running on natural gas, that's usually CO, CO2 and NOx. The, the SGT400 is a relatively modern, relatively clean gas turbine. So most of our focus was actually on the CO2 aspect initially, disregarding CO, CO and NOx for the time being. So with regard to the CO2, could we capture it? Could we store it? Could we use it? And here we were presented with an interesting trade-off. If we size the unit for full load operation, um, we're looking at a relatively large unit with a, a relatively large footprint. However, this turbine, the case study that we looked at for this project, it's operated intermittently. And that intermittency actually meant that the overall produced volumes were relatively low. Um, so it meant that the justification for capex might be a, a, a bit challenging. However, there were positive sides as well. You know, if we looked at transport away from the site, how do we get the CO2 away from the site? It meant that links by a road were actually feasible or more feasible than something like installation of a, of a permanent pipeline. But ultimately, we think the best path to decarbonisation with this unit would be to transition the gas turbine to run on hydrogen potentially supplemented by the hydrogen that was produced by the uh, by the electrolyzer. And that, of course, could be carried over to, to other turbines within the fleet. Now, there are ongoing challenges with this combustor, combustor stability, NOx and so on. And we were involved with several projects with natural gas transmission uh, and other work like this, where we're looking at those challenges and how to address them moving forward. Just the one slide from me. I think that's it. I'm going to hand over back to Matthew. If you could go to the next slide, please. Yep, thank you very much, Dan. Um, so just to bring us to the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll finish by talking about some of the plans for the alpha phase. So um, finalising those use cases and looking at the requirements for actually carrying out a demonstration. Ultimately, that is what we want to do in the beta phase. So once we carry out a sort of full site selection, uh, we'll be able to nail down and move on to the full system design and get a better understanding uh, of the costs. Um, we also need to understand how the sort of new this new equipment would interact with existing equipment and infrastructure on the site, particularly during operation. Um, we need to uh, sort of bring in some overlap with our parallel uh, SIF project, which is also going through the discovery phase. Um, that's looking at hybrid solid state storage uh, of hydrogen on site. If you're not sick of hearing me talking, you can hear me speak about that tomorrow morning. Um, Finally, uh, well, not finally, but we also need to come up with a testing plan. Um, so we actually need, during the demonstration, we actually need to demonstrate that this system will give us the benefits that we expect to see. Um, depending on the site selection, uh, there could be local hydrogen users. Um, so within this phase, we've sort of identified a couple of sites which, which may have hydrogen users who can, who can sort of offtake any surplus hydrogen um, that, that we're producing. Um, and then obviously we'll continue to sort of build the business case as, as it develops, uh, as the system develops uh, and look at how we could potentially roll this out uh, across the whole of the NTS. Um, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. I think you can flick on to the next slide uh, and I think we've got some time for some questions. Thank you very much for listening.
Uh, thanks for that presentation. We will have a little bit of extra time um, for questions. Um, I'm just going to uh, choose some from the Q&A. Uh, so have you considered a scenario where there is a use of high pressure electrolyzers, which might lessen no compression? Uh, so we are focused on the, the solid oxide electrolyzer simply because it can uh, utilize that waste heat. Uh, but Stefan, I don't know if you can add a few words in terms of the, the pressure coming out of the solid oxide electrolyzer. Yes, the, the pressure of the solid oxide electrolyzer is around one bar, uh, but we made some calculations and um, uh, compression energy uh, to uh, reach, let, let's say, 60 bars. Uh, it's uh, uh, not so uh, uh, expensive and it's much less than uh, what we gain by uh, having this uh, uh, waste heat integration. So um, the electrolyzer will consume much less electricity compared to how much electricity is needed for compressor to compress uh, to a higher pressures. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, yeah, it's also worth mentioning, I think our, our sort of turbines need about 30 bar, perhaps, in terms of the fuel gas pressure. Uh, also, if we consider the hybrid solid state storage system that we're looking at in the other project, um, these systems um, are sort of more lower pressure uh, than traditional compressed gas storage solutions. Thanks. Great. So there's another question here for Stefan. Uh, interesting to see the reduction on cost improvement and efficient and efficiency from 2023 to 2030. Can you describe where this improvement comes from? Uh, these improvements will will come uh, mainly uh, by uh, having a, a lower cost of the uh, renewable electricity. Um, for, for example, uh, I, I was taking um, uh, 135 uh, pounds per uh, kilowatt hour uh, for 2023. Uh, in 2030, we expect uh, that, uh, that the price to be much lower than, than, than that. And um, um, other um, uh, uh, means to, to reduce the cost is because the uh, mass manufacturing and uh, supply chain will um, uh, we expect to to, to be um, uh, much uh, 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 cheaper in 2030. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, will all the H2 produced from if so EC be used on site, what happens to any excess? Yeah, so I kind of kind of alluded to this towards the end of the presentation. There, there could well be times, depending on the specific site and the, the turbine utilisation, um, it's definitely worth capturing all of the waste heat. Um, whether it's worth putting all this waste heat into hydrogen production and having so much excess, um, that's still still a bit of a, a challenge uh, around the system, but we are looking at, at options where there's there's other uh, ways to utilize the hydrogen other than the turbine. So whether that's within the site itself, so um, there's other sort of uses perhaps like domestic heating on site and standby generators that we have, uh, but we are looking to sort of engage with uh, hydrogen users uh, that are sort of in close proximity to certain certain sites that we have on the network. It's not it's not the case for all of them, certainly, because a lot of our compressor stations are are in remote locations. So so yeah, we are exploring it anyway. Thanks. And have you considered a scenario where there is a use of high pressure electrolyzers, which might less oh sorry, which might less no compression? Uh, I did. Do we have that oh, one? Sorry, I've already had that one. Yeah, um, no sorry, um, who will own the SOAC system? Are national gas allowed to own hydrogen generators? Will they be eligible for business model support scheme? Yeah, so it's a good question. So we, we can't own and operate uh, hydrogen uh, production or storage facilities as we're, we're licensed as the gas transporter. That's absolutely right. Um, so we would need to look into the alternative uh, business models that are out there. Um, I don't know if there's a specific scheme mentioned in the questions, so I guess we'd be open to, to exploring that. But we have run feasibility studies in the past looking at, at this kind of thing. Um, so it's a case of tapping into those as well. Great. Um, 
I think that is all of our questions. Um, I think the second question hasn't been answered. Oh. All right. Uh, who will? No, I think we did have that one answered. Do we not? Well, the first one. Sorry, no. It's uh, there's there's one on the waste heat waste recovery. recovery model for. Oh yes. Yeah. So hydrogen um, and natural gas. Yeah. Is the waste heat recovery modeling for natural gas or hydrogen turbines are the system conditions the same for both? I'll let you go, Richard, if, if that's OK. You seem yeah, ready to answer it. Yeah, the um, the fuels for the gas turbine were modelled from 100% uh, natural gas, um, three blends of natural gas with hydrogen in various proportions and also 100% hydrogen. The exhaust gas that comes from the gas turbine is very slightly different, obviously, with the different combustion products, products, but the gas turbine is a very air dominated, if you like, the exhaust gas is dominated by the vast airflow through it. So there isn't a great change in exhaust gas composition and properties. The There's some published papers, um, some studies that the um, gas turbine efficiency is not much different or there's uh, hardly any difference uh, running on hydrogen than running on natural gas. Um, so for this purpose of this study, it was considered that the gas turbine efficiency would be the same, um, irrespective of the fuel, fuel blends. Um, but as part of the next hopeful phase for alpha, the alpha phase, um, this gas turbine performance on hydrogen would be looked at in more detail. Thank you. Right. So we're running a couple of minutes ahead, but it looks like that is the end of the questions. Um, thank you very much, both. Um, we'll now move on to Calfacto. Next slide, please. Thanks. Great. Uh, over to you. I think Chris is stuck on mute and I, I'm not sure how he, he's, why he's not coming off. Don't know if anyone can Thank unmute you. him. Sorry, I oh, was, uh, yeah, <laughs> there was something stopping me uh, coming off mute. I'm not, not entirely sure why, but um, it seems to be resolved now. Um, hi, I'm Chris Taylor. I'm the Technical Development Director for Vital Energy and uh, here to talk about uh, Calfacto Latent Energy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is the project partners. So um, I, I work for Vital Energy and we were sort of lead partner alongside, uh, sorry, SGM was the lead partner uh, and we were sort of secondary lead partner to them. Um, and we also had Imperial College, University of Birmingham and two city councils who were partners in the projects as well. Next slide, please. Right, so the problem that we were trying to address was looking at um, how heat pump efficiency is impacted when it's coupled with storage. So I think as uh, a lot of people know, studies of plenty of studies have shown the benefits of um, flexibility and decarbonized heating, um, specifically looking at as we move over from, from gas, um, and this is focusing on air source heat pump or heat pumps in general. Um, Flexibility is provided by storage. If you look at sensible storage, the density increases with its operating temperature range. So for example, if you had a fixed volume of storage, if it operated between say 70 and 75 degrees, if you operated that same store between 70 and 90 degrees, you would um, quadruple the storage. So when coupling a heat pump with a sensible store, then the heat pump needs to deliver at the higher temperature to be able to reach the high ends of the store. Um, and heat pump efficiencies or coefficient of performance reduce with um, higher outflow temperatures. Next slide, please. Right, so our, our project is um, looking at direct coupling of the heat pump working fluid with uh, a phase change material store. Um, just so everyone knows, this project is um, 
intended to be combined with community energy hubs for the alpha phase um, application and there's a presentation being delivered on that in the 15th at 10 40. Um, there'll be some things that we refer to in this presentation but maybe brush over slightly because we don't have the time um, but if you attend that presentation should be able to be make it clearer so within this um, the heat pump can operate in its traditional way which is uh, diagram one it can also then have the working fluid directly interfacing with a phase change material store, which is diagram two. That store can then discharge directly into whatever scheme via uh, interface with the, the water in the same way a heat pump does. And then in, uh, which is diagram three, and then diagram four is showing the two things operating in parallel. So this allows for lower condensing temperatures to be used in the, in the heat pump. And that provides flexibility and storage without impacting on the COP. And the parallel discharge allows you to boost the capacity of the um, of the heat pump. Next slide, please. So the technology users, um, heat users who want certainty over their hot water and heating when it's required, and they want to minimise their ongoing heating costs. The equipment purchaser, who may be different from the the heat user, wants to minimise capital investment and also um, Idea they have a package system so they're not having to specify and procure different pieces of equipment for multiple suppliers. Uh, from the grid's point of view, they want to reduce peak demands, reduce overall annual consumption, and have demand side response to um, reduce curtailment. Next slide, please. Uh, so, the project activities that we undertook. Um, the heat pump storage and sizing was the, the first one that we looked at. Uh, before we started to get really into that, we had to find an end user um, design point um, because if you choose different ultimate temperatures, that's going to affect your sort of upstream design. Um, we didn't want to consider things which required end users or the, the homeowner to have significant investment in their property when they're also having to um, invest in potentially invest in um, heat pumps and stores and, and other material under equipment to decarbonize their heating. So we looked at what we thought was the minimum potential achievable temperature by altering behaviors rather than altering equipment. So we went for a flow and return of um, six 40 which is, is is potentially pushing it um we looked at as i said that diagram below shows direct coupling of the of the um, heat pump with a condensing temperature of 70 degrees to supply that um that 60 40 uh, return temperature we looked at a representative heat profile so vital energy have um, lots of information on um, district heating schemes so we took a representative um, heat profile from a kind of average over a number of schemes to show some diversity really and that that graph just shows the sort of half hourly data across the year and across 24 hours as well um to model it we looked at 25 year forecasts for both for a day ahead balancing mechanism and intraday markets uh, we used a company for Beringa to to deliver those who are sort of well whilst yeah you can argue the accuracy of, of 25 year price forecast but we have to go on something and they're the best people in the market to give that information we developed a project model within software called plexos which is an, an optimization tool and we use the model to compare different options for heat pump sizes and different amounts of storage and we also modeled this against a counterfactual of a heat pump um, using no storage Next slide, please. Uh, so we did a heat pump review. We wanted to look at the different working fluids that were out there to um, design the heat pump for interfacing with the store. Uh, we wanted to look at the different thermal properties in terms of the COP profile, the temperature range they operate over, uh, but also sort of particular attention on the sort of physical properties such as GWP and flammability. GWP is a global warming potential, and we didn't want to pick a heat pump working fluid which had a global warming potential, which ultimately might lead it to be um, unavailable for purchase. And flammability is obviously a concern. Um, uh, when we're looking at potentially housing these things in domestic locations. Uh, we looked at as well options for improving efficiency, other options, sort of general options for improving efficiency and the potential limitations of, of scale. 
Um, and that was carried out by Vital Energy even because we've got an internal heat pump team. Uh, the PCM review was carried out by the University of Birmingham. They shortlisted a number of phase change materials that would be suitable for the applications in interfacing with the identified heat pump working fluid. We reviewed the thermal properties such as you know the melting point and the thermal conductivity, energy density of the one PCM against the other. And we were also reviewed again the physical properties such as sustainability, recyclability, density, flammability of the, the PCM as well. Uh, we then gave some commercial considerations such as the pricing and availability of the PCM. Uh, next slide please. Uh, SGN looked at some of the local infrastructure um, benefits so particularly we were sort of considering a hybrid um, case and looking at a balanced approach of having a, uh, a hybrid heat pump where you've got the heat pump and store and then your gas providing you some of the uh, additional top up and reviewed and assessed the infrastructure in certain areas and its applicability for conversion to hydrogen or indeed how that infrastructure could be maintained and converted to hydrogen if the gas the peak gas um, production was or demand was reduced on the basis of implementing the scheme um, and we had uh, Imperial College who were doing the whole system impact they use their integrated whole system energy model and that can look at the calculations for saying how much the the benefit to the system is in in sort of pound notes um, for implementation of this and we compared the the cap factor latent heat against the counterfactual of a smaller storage and the lower COP heat pump. We actually designed a counterfactual case to allow us to accurately come up with um, the COP profile for um, Imperial to use in their modeling. And that was done using the leading the way net zero scenario and deep electrification of heat. And it compared the generation mix distribution and transmission costs on the basis of the two um, things being analyzed. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so this is the findings. Um, overall, and the overarching finding is there's a misalignment between the benefits for the end user for implementing um, storage and, and some of these improvements against the whole system. So the imperial modeling showed the system benefits on the basis of this being rolled out into every single home. Um, so kind of a limitation of their modeling um, that they can't show different proportions. That showed an 18.4 billion pounds a year benefit to the system for implementing this. Uh, I'll caveat that was saying that some of that benefit would be reduced um, the, the counterfactual itself needs to be optimized, which sort of comes on to some of the points we make later. In the Plexos modeling that we did, we showed that the heat pump, um, so that the, the benefits, if applied, the benefits to the individual users in terms of sort of savings on their bills, if multipled and, and applied to 25 million homes to match the Imperial College modeling was about 2.2 billion a year. So the impact of the long-term whole system cost to the end user isn't isn't captured within the the Plexos modeling as it's it's a price taker. So there's no feedback loop. So for example, um, in uh, in reality, what would happen is as you didn't put a lot of storage into the into the system, that would impact on the pricing to, of the electricity. So the you would get these spikes during certain periods, and, and you would have increased pricing within those periods. Um, however, that's not shown. That example case would happen over a period of time. So if we're looking at the acceleration of decarbonized heat, we need to focus on the on the near term users. And I think what the modeling showed was that the benefit to the user for implementing certain systems, not necessarily just the CAFACTO one, but you know, storage systems in general and increased CAPEX systems, they're not going to see that payback that might justify the investment to them. However, if those aren't done, the, the benefits to the grid will be um, completely missed. Uh, so the heating solution um, is optimized for end users. So Vital Energy are a, um, are a heating solutions provider obviously our target is to provide the best opportunity for our customer to reduce their their heating bills that could be done by looking at a capex reduction such as using a smaller heat pump using the storage to allow you to do that um, making the heat pump closer to base load to so increase its utilization the heat pump is kind of the most expensive um, part of the system um, but the flexibility and therefore the system benefit is significantly reduced by doing that so if everyone for example or 25 million people had a base load heat pump uh, and and um, 
uh, use their storage, then the grid wouldn't be designed to, to, to do that and it would cause further downstream problems. Technical findings, can factor late in the heat, improves efficiency of heat pumps when coupled with, with storage. Um, other options were identified, however, for improving the efficiency of, of um, and the flexibility of decarbonised heating. And we think that the technology is best optimised as within an overall heating and storage solution rather than in isolation. Next slide, please. Uh, future activities. So, as mentioned, Vital Energy are a provider for heating solutions, and we develop optimised with the end user in mind. And the instinct has been, um, would be to do that. Um, and what this project has shown us is that we need to consider the overall um, system modelling. Showed that focusing on the end user investor case misses quite a lot of the the wider system benefits. Um, I think, as I mentioned before on the previous slide, that's going to over time result in higher costs and in the end that would all filter back to the the user um, so those higher investments in in the grid infrastructure would ultimately lead to higher bills for the end user um, modeling of heat generation and storage needs to be combined to look at both the benefits to the end user and the benefits to the whole system if we just consider one or the other then then we're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities um, the optimization of the heating solution needs to consider not just Calfacto, we need to consider how Calfacto would interface with, with other technologies. I think as we found the narrow, the instinct was to optimize the whole system and, and some of our team came up with really novel ideas and we didn't feel that that was, you know, these things weren't out in the market and they weren't necessarily the best counterfactual to, um, to utilize. Um, Ultimately, we've, we've talked about combining with the Community Energy Hubs project, and that would allow us to give a wider remit and optimise part of their local hub solution. Um, and also, when you model something on the basis of a, a energy scheme rather than directly for the end user, some of the benefits to, to the heat network kind of mirror the benefits that you have to the overall system for including storage, i.e. if you've got an electrical-led um, heating system, having storage within a network allows that grid connection to go further and that kind of mirrors some of the um the benefits to the the wider grid next slide please uh so this is yeah a bit a, a bit of a rehash bit of a rehash is the conclusions and discussion of the next steps so conclusion the whole system benefits of increased flexibility and efficiency were significant of with increased flexibility and efficiency were significant um so that bit yeah that that being said um we don't think that all of the benefits shown by Calfacto would be delivered just by this system we think that that is saying if you have uh, better efficiency and better storage within the heating solutions then um that that is shown to deliver a, a massive saving to the overall system so we need to consider all the ways that those attributes can be delivered by an optimized heating solution uh, the benefits of storage's conclusion, benefits of storage weren't realised by the technology purchaser, so we need to look at um, targeting um, different markets that aren't the individual user, such as heat service provider. Um, purchasers' interests need to align with the grid. Again, distributed heat networks uh, might show some of that benefit that um, replicates what's shown to the grid. Uh, Calfacto technology is best optimised with other heating and storage solutions. So as a next step, we're looking to optimise that alongside other technologies such as high temperature storage or resistive heating. And also uh, scale provides a greater opportunity for optimization. So what we what we found was that as you go up in size for, um, for heat pumps, then there are ways to improve the efficiency of the heat pump just on its own, not even when coupled with storage. So again, heat networks provide that that scale. Uh, so overarching steps, this project will combine with community energy for the upper application and uh, Cafactor will become a work package within that, um, seeking to optimize the flexibility and efficiency of these local hubs, which are part of the energy hubs project, um, delivering generated, uh, electricity generated heat as a service. Um, that's me, done. Right. Just in time. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, so we'll now go to some Q&A for uh, five minutes. Um, is the waste heat recovery modeling for natural gas or hydrogen? I think that's from the last, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> the last one. That's no problem. Okay, Do you want me to read? I don't mind reading. Yeah, I've got the old ones up for some reason. Oh, okay, so one says, who would commercialize and operate the thermal storage unit? Um, that's a that's a key question for us initially we'd done that on the basis of 
So Vital Energy are a, a, a DH provider. Um, we wanted specifically to look at the technology and initially we were going to focus this on a, is this a product that could be sold that would improve the situation for the um, uh, for the end user? I think as some of the points that we've raised in, in this were not initially anyway, it's going to be developed um, for integration within a heat network. And then I think maybe as the technology develops, that might flow down into um, smaller domestic units. And how we would exactly commercialize that is, is up for debate, whether we license that to somebody else or, or how it works. So I don't know at this point. Um, next one is, what level of coordination of the thermal energy store is needed with the DSO and the ESO to achieve these large figure benefits? Um, in terms of the coordination, um, trying to think, they they would have to map out how they were how how the decarbonisation of heat is going to affect their their infrastructure and what additional demands are being um, led on the system. I don't currently know, and we're going to include a DSO in the in the alpha stage application. I don't know what they use in their modelling for looking at you know um, what level of is it going to be deep electrification of heat like um, Imperial College was assumed? What we found is in some of the Imperial College previous modeling that the COP profiles they've used for heat pumps weren't particularly accurate. And, and we had to create a new base case and then um, a new case for the example of, of, of CalFacto. So we were looking at the benefits of, of one versus the, versus the other. I'd be very interested to understand what COP profiles and, and how the DSO and the ESO do their modeling for, for these, and then how that influences their, their infrastructure rollout to, to meet those sort of prospective demands. Um, what level of home efficiency did you, oh, sorry. Where's it gone? Um, oh, that's gone, that one. Um, can the PCM tech be scaled up to be used in district heating schemes? I, actually, that's our intention is to use them initially within a district heating scheme environment and then maybe look to filter down the technology. That came as we went through the process. One of the key things that we found was as we were looking at the options for both CalFactor and against the counterfactual as well was when you're optimizing a heat pump design and you're looking at it in the domestic single individual domestic user scale you're giving away an awful lot of efficiency benefits that you can't achieve um that you can achieve sorry when you look at larger systems which might connect into into a dh um what that means is when you look at the imperial college modeling and we say okay well there's there's potentially huge benefits to the system for increasing the you know reducing the amount of uh, electricity that's needed to generate that heat through those efficiency benefits um, that looking at district heating as being one of the key um, the, the key elements for delivering decarbonized heat as opposed to the individual domestic heat pump is why we've sort of combining with CalFactor in the, uh, sorry, community energy hubs in, in the alpha phase application. And a lot of work will be done in sort of highlighting the amount of housing stock that we could access through their sort of, they have novel um, heat networks that they're looking at um, uh, and maybe which portion of both houses, which were, would have been um, looked at from normal district heating schemes and houses that would be looked at through their sort of more novel um, or sorry um, that could be taken by the novel district heating scheme and then which portion of the domestic individual domestic heat point users that could also be uh, achieved by that um, what level of home efficiency did you assume in your modeling and insights on that aspect uh, we we didn't um, we didn't do a lot of work in terms of the 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 home efficiency what we wanted to say was let's look at a case if you are looking to sell a unit to someone or deliver heat into their home we picked 760 degrees because we thought potentially that could be achieved and there's some work that had been done that that could be achieved through changes in behavior i.e turn your radiator temperature down and have your heating on for longer periods of time and that you could still achieve thermal comfort without significant investment in insulation and um you know secondary side changes such as increasing radiator um, area uh, what 
that benefits would then come if those things were introduced at a later date. But what we wanted to be in a position was somebody could say, well, I will buy that bit of kit. It will work with my existing uh, levels of insulation and my existing radiators today. And then I can reduce, introduce those changes later. Um, cool. I hope that answers the um, question. Great. Uh, so we're going to have to go to a short break now, um, but thanks, Chris, for um, answering those questions. My um, my questions were not updating as they came through. No um, problem. Yeah, 10 minute break, um, and then we'll see. Right, all. Um, so hopefully everyone is back. Um, we will be moving over to our next presentation, which is Retrometer. Um, so I will be handing over to Geraldine, I believe. Yeah, that's right, Ellen. Yeah, thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Geraldine Patterson, Innovation Manager at Electricity Northwest. Um, if you'd like to move on to the next slide, please. Um, it's uh, widely acknowledged that greater levels of domestic energy demand reduction is needed, both to help reduce the requirements for generation and to lower distribution network costs through deployment of reinforcement. But retrofitting energy efficiency measures at the domestic level isn't really happening in part because although we can meter energy, we can't really effectively meter energy savings. So why can't we meter energy savings? Well, there are a number of factors which make it difficult. A change in weather patterns leads to different energy demands. So you can't really subtract the energy you would use today to an equivalent day from last year if the, if the weather's different. Customers don't use the same appliances at the same time every day. So there's a time of use factor with even comparing day by day. And if a customer does save money on the heating bill following some retrofit um, measures being installed, rather than bank the savings, they may actually turn the heating up a degree, um, known as comfort take back, just to make the houses a little more comfortable. So to solve this problem, Retrometer is exploring building effectively meter energy savings, which can be then be used to inform a series of business and delivery models including creating an effective way for networks to quantify the demand reduction, which will inform our reinforcement and flexibility requirements going forward. So today we'll present the findings from the discovery phase research into the technical methodology for delivery of the solution, the business models and the value streams associated with metered energy savings, as well as outlining the next steps for alpha and looking ahead into our beta phases. So can I have the next slide, please? I'd like to pass to Sam. Hi, I'm Sam from Energy Systems Catapult, and we were responsible for the, the technical methodology evaluation. And to, to enable us to kind of cover as broad a scope as possible, um, whilst limiting the technical complexity, we identified uh, three different areas where we should focus. So the first is on focusing on homes with gas heating, which represent about three quarters of the UK housing stock. Um, Whilst there are obviously other forms of heating type, uh, gas heated homes have the advantage of the gas price doesn't vary by time of use, so we don't have to use um, time of use tariffs. Um, we also then looked at using gas smart meter data and external temperature data, um, not because we need the half hourly granularity, and in fact we intend to model daily, um, but be because it gives us that ability to kind of have a standardized daily view. And then the other key thing was um, some methodologies require kind of pre-retrofit internal temperature for significant periods. Um, but obviously that's that's not available for many, many homes. Um, and so we kind of designed our methodology such that they don't require pre-retrofit internal temperature. Next slide, please. In the process of evaluating different approaches, um, we looked at existing methodologies. Um, so the first of these is Caltrack, which is an existing open source methodology in the, the US. Um, it works pretty well in the US. Some business models have been built on it. Um, we just need to validate that it works on UK homes. But one of the limitations of that is if there are big changes in society, like the energy price crisis or COVID-19, um, Caltrack doesn't pick it up because it looks at the history of an individual home. Um, and so one way to handle this is to look at comparison based methodologies where you compare the, the home that's had the retrofit with similar homes that haven't had a retrofit. And again, some kind of open source methodologies exist for this in the US, and we're looking to, to adapt those for, for UK use. 
But even those comparison-based methodologies struggle with the challenge that Geraldine articulated of comfort take back and changes in consumer behavior. Um, and that's where we kind of looked at some physics-based methodologies where you look at what were the internal temperatures um, after the retrofit and you, it, you recalculate what the energy use pre-retrofit would have been to achieve those same target temperatures. Um, and this is an area where there's been work up, but there's no kind of open source methodology developed. We also looked at, at probabilistic um, methods, but found that they didn't, they, the complexity that they offered kind of didn't deliver the value that we needed. So the, the goal of uh, alpha phase would be to, to test the existing methodologies, but also kind of stack them together in this Caltrack plus comparison plus physics base to, to allow us to, to have a, a solution that measures kind of comfort take back as well as looking at the, the individual kind of energy saving. Next slide, please. Back one, please, thank you. Um, one of the key things for this is access to smart meter data, and that's historically been a significant challenge for projects like this. Um, and uh, in exploring this, we looked at CERL, the Smart Energy Research Lab, um, that, that has kind of 13,000 homes, uh, two years worth of data, or more than two years in some cases. But the, the challenge there is kind of quite complex access requirements and the need to work within the kind of banner of an academic organization. Um, and so we also found Hildebrand um, who have uh, tens of thousands of homes and kind of historical smart meter data, and they can make that accessible for decarbonization related research at cost. Um, so that's, that's the data set that we're intending to use for Alpha. And then putting that data together, kind of training some models, the, the end result will be a standardized open source kind of methodology for metered energy savings for the UK that then can enable people to build different business models and different products on top of. Next slide, please. And over to you, Connor. Hi there. So on the, on the, uh, the subject of, of business models, we're going to take some time now to describe some of the delivery models that we've looked at throughout the whole process. Um, and we found these, we're looking at delivery models here that are quite novel and they've really been enabled by metered energy savings and, and the methods that Sam's been looked at. And that's because these methods will provide the greater certainty that's needed to unlock new value streams, uh, to reallocate some of the risk that's currently present within the market uh, and to lower transaction costs of assessing uh, and targeting retrofit, which will therefore unlock retrofit at scale and, and target segments that haven't been looked at in depth so far. Um, as part of this, our approach from the start really has been forward looking. We know that this topic spreads across all parts of the network and interlinks closely with the valuation of energy efficiency and, and flexibility more generally. Um, and so we're looking with this work to, to validate a range of bottom up delivery models um, with the domestic context driving a lot of the complexity that we need to look at and understand throughout the market. And our aim here really was to create delivery models that are transparent, so they're open source and they're accessible for all parts of the market, whether that's contractors all the way through to consumers. We need them to be equitable, so they need to be able to support retrofit in all types of tenure and all types of the market currently, not just the kind of able to pay in the wealthier, <clears throat> more cost effective segments. And finally, they need to be both sustainable and robust. So the idea is that they're resilient to changing values of revenue streams over time and across places, particularly for some of the grant funding that we know is a bit of a postcode lottery. Um, and we need to know that they'll work reliably in, in various market segments um, and therefore must be able to handle multiple revenue streams uh, and multiple layers of uncertainty and error, as demonstrated by Sam's different kind of tiered methods. And you can see the complexity of these revenue streams in the graph in the bottom right of this slide. Um, and that shows a, a range of flows of energy, uh, data, and also these revenue or value streams across eight actors, spanning various levels of the energy system from the grid to the DNO level to the household levels of the market. Next slide, please. Fantastic. So in order to examine these revenue streams, we use data from the Distribution Future Energy Scenarios, or DFES, to estimate the impact of installing uh, heat pumps or delivering deep retrofit to about 100,000 homes across Manchester. 
Uh, we use an exemplar retrofit from the Your Home Better retrofit planner to help put some structure around this. Uh, and that was a system that was commissioned by Greater Manchester Combined Authority. So really looking at the, the ecosystem of tools um, available within Manchester and, and how this might work using those place-based systems in, in various locations. Uh, this found that deferred network reinforcement costs could provide somewhere in the region of £50 million towards the funding of these deep retrofits. Now, that comes from a 65% reduction in heat demand modelled by Lingard et al, flowing through into a reduction in electrical input um, or capacity to the overall size of the heat pumps. We think the latter is much more likely uh, in the real world. Uh, and this value, again, was modelled using real network costs, the cost of of real network components and replacing or upscaling those and some existing flex contracts um, that were available within Electricity North West. The idea being that payments will be made each winter over a five year period. It's important to state at this stage that this is the first pass in specifying this value. Um, but we found that it triangulates fairly well with other sources. Um, we do know that we'll need further examination in detail, um, but at this stage, the clear takeaway is that this value alone is not enough. It's not enough to fund retrofit. Um, it's less than 1% of the total cost of those um, modelled deep retrofits, the 100,000 homes that we looked at by 2030. This really just drives home the need uh, to blend different revenue streams, which in turn highlights the importance of these metered energy savings methods and the robustness they bring in uh, unlocking a blended value stack um, providing greater certainty to the real value that's being delivered to consumers and making a more robust solution that can be deployed in different places. We know that this robustness will be fed through into the scheme design, and that's one of our key learnings moving forward into subsequent stages, to look at these really specific parts of the scheme, how they're designed, and to compare the real values to those that we've hypothesized so far. Equally, therefore, we need to focus on a little bit on the centralized policy, and how that can specify some of the uncertainty thresholds and how that ultimately will impact the robustness of the offer and how retrofit will be subsidised at scale. In order to talk a little bit more about these key learnings, uh, I'm going to pass over to our colleague Jonathan now. Next slide, please. Thanks very much, Connor. Um, so, yeah, I'm Jonathan Atkinson. I'm retrofit lead at Carbon Co-op. We're a community energy organisation, but also we act as an ESCO delivering retrofit um, in area-based schemes and working closely with Manchester City Council. Uh, we're based here in Manchester. So as Geraldine set out, we're looking to see how a metered energy savings approach, how an innovative uh, development of a metered energy savings approach can unlock retrofit and in turn offer energy system benefits. And to summarize the learning that's come from Sam and, and Connor, um, firstly on the methodology and then looking at income streams, the, uh, we know that daily modelling of gas heated homes is sufficient to unlock some of these use cases. Um, we've got the data that we need to. And secondarily, as he, as he mentioned, Hildebrand is a really good source of historical gas smart meter data. It's accessible, we can integrate with it. It's really high quality data. Uh, as, as Sam said, it's been a concern in the past. Um, we can also account for that behaviour change, which I know for many that work in the retrofit sector is a real kind of concern. How do you account for changes in how and when people, you know, have their uh, tea in the evening or when they heat their homes uh, and that sort of thing? And building up these kind of three different methodologies um, gives us the opportunity to account for that kind of really hard to find stuff. Um, as Connor said, we need to um, advocate for the development and standardisation of nat national objectives in this sector um, to help us with those income streams and help us build business models and that the payment schedules and the scheme designs in particular need to support that. Uh, next slide. So that's all the learning we've gained from discovery and we think this gives us a really good basis to build on for, for the alpha stage. We're looking at four different work packages here. Um, further testing and developing that methodology. We've done the groundwork, now we need to do some of the hard work in developing, especially that physics-based component. On the income streams and the, and the value, value chains, we're looking at um, nailing down some of those figures, quantifying those numbers, 
Um, uh, we know the diverse income streams that can be stacked together to support retrofit. How do they look like? How do they fit together? Looking ahead to beta phase, we're actually going to be doing some retrofit projects um, uh, in the real world to look at how our metered energy savings approach supports this real world savings. And finally, we've taken on board the fact that we need to affect change within the policy making circles and disseminate our results as well. So that's all going to be part of our alpha phase application we're doing now. And then the final slide. Just to give you a little hint of what we're looking at for delivery. We've got an SHDF scheme in Manchester, a thousand homes is going to give us a huge data set and a really good opportunity to look at actual delivery and how we can use metered energy saving approach to um, evidence that. We also have a carbon crop scheme, much smaller, but we have a lot higher degree of control in how that's specified and how it's delivered. And so those two approaches in beta phase will give some really great real world uh, data to support our innovation. Thanks very much, and we're happy to answer questions. Fantastic. So we can see some questions coming through now. Uh, so I'll start with this one. What is the impact of adding the network value stack to ROIA slash IRR for the energy efficiency measures in a standard dwelling? Connor, is that one for you? Sure. So we, we haven't actually modelled the specific uh, return on investment. Um, the obviously that is a, a, a completely acceptable route to go down. A lot of the context that we were looking at were looking more at socialised value. So how do we in fact reduce the socialised costs? Um, and so using various forms of retrofit uh, value stacks, we're actually looking to bring down the cost that the consumer pays um, or the cost that, that might need to be subsidised through grants um, from the, the market more generally. Um, and so we look at a range of, of different scenarios um, around how to reduce the, the occupant contributions. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't modeled it from a kind of investment perspective. Um, the idea being that uh, we really want this retrofit to be accessible to all parts of the market, um, not just those where that see it kind of as an investment moving forward. Um, the other aspect here around um, the kind of return on the investment from a socialized perspective is, is addressing some of the externalities that currently result from underheating um, and poor home energy performance, such as the kind of socialized healthcare costs uh, that come from people underheating their home and getting a better understanding of how a retrofit can start to address some of those social problems um, and how that value can be captured as a kind of regional scale. Um, so apologies, we don't have a specific kind of percentage impact on, on the ROI or, or the IRR, um, but that is something that we'll start to look at um, in the future stages as, as we explore the different tenures uh, and the different perspectives on funding and financing this. And if I can just briefly um, add in a context from delivery. So we're delivering an area-based scheme in South Manchester with the city council. We're drawing on various different income sources there. Um, grant uh, lending, uh, social lending to the householders and um, a network flexibility payment, though small and a small proportion can help viability and it can help it tip it over the edge. And the, um, the, the values that Connor shared, they are idealized over a huge cohort, but in specific areas, the value can be quite high. I would also say we're trying to overcome a perverse incentive that exists within the flexibility market at the moment in that you have to baseline a certain amount of electricity demand and reduce that um, to gain an incentive payment. Um, where the building has gas at the moment, what you're effectively saying is they have to put in a really big heat pump, baseline that, and then there'll be a flexibility payment that will enable them to put a smaller heat pump in which is obviously a kind of perverse incentive and not what we want to do at all. So there are different elements to this value stack and different elements to how we're going to articulate that within our alpha phase bid. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so another question here, would this need post intervention, intervention monitoring to ensure that demand reduction is happening in the shape and form needed to avoid reinforcement? What would do this? I think that's one for Sam. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it would. And so that's the kind of intent for the whole methodology is to to pro provide a way to do that 
monitoring in a standardized way. Um, the who would do it, that is a factor depending on the, the business model. So we can kind of like see different people who would end up doing it. But the key is by, by providing a standardized way for, for measuring that the demand reduction is happening, um, that enables kind of uh, confidence in all of the different stakeholders rather than it being, we've got this technique, we've got this technique, we've got this technique. Um, it's kind of like a standardized, transparent um, methodology. Great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so another question here. Have you considered the interactions between flex and energy efficiency? There could be additional value if done sequentially, especially, especially for thermal efficiency potentially. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the uh, business models that we've considered is the idea of an aggregate or ESCO. And um, this is it's been developed in kind of EU policy making circles and adapted in to some extent in the UK. But it's the idea of an intermediary that will that will um, deliver energy efficiency within an area, but integrate flexibility services within that in a kind of ongoing aggregator kind of relationship. And there's there's huge benefits there. Um, we we Carbon Corp kind of straddle both sectors. We we do. Uh, flexibility services we do retrofit as well and it's surprising how little interaction there is between the energy efficiency sector and the aggregation sector and we often hear quite a lot of advocates within energy efficiency saying just fit heat pumps just get them in there it doesn't matter about energy efficiency but as one of the other questions kind of references we're storing up problems later down the line by building like huge electricity demand into the system. We can overcome that at an early stage to offset further costs further down the line. So it's very powerful. I, I don't know whether, Connor, you want to add to that at all. No, I think you covered everything there, Jonathan. Thank you. So, uh... Along with gas meter data, did you um, did you have the corresponding electrical meter data project? So it, it is available, but we don't need to use it. Um, the this is part of the the focus on gas heated homes. Um, really means that you the only things that you're really interested in in terms of metering the energy saving are what would the gas usage have been. Um, and you compare that to the actual measured kind of either future gas usage if they haven't changed fuel or specifically the the heat metered heat pump energy usage. So you're not kind of trying to disaggregate the heating um, out from the, the other electrical data. And so it really simplifies the problem um, for, for the vast majority, kind of three quarters of, of homes. Um, and that really makes it easy to scale and make it easy for people to, to use more broadly. Great. Um, so I think that um, that brings us to the end of our time for Q&A. Um, but thank you very much. There's still a few questions in the chat that can be answered as well. Thanks. Yeah. Great. And over to Pioneer. Thank you. <clears throat> so yes, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob Lynch. Uh, Innovation Engineer uh, at National Grid. And today I'll be uh, presenting uh, Pioneer, which stands for Proportional Investment of Networks in Energy Efficiency uh, Retrofit. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so looking at the, the problem statement, uh, according to the, the Climate Change Committee, uh, energy efficiency has the, the potential to save up to around six billion pounds per year uh, across the whole energy system. Uh, the rollout of such uh, thermal energy efficiency measures has been uh, poor today. Uh, the basis of uh, Pioneer has been a, a follow-on to one of our NIA projects called Defender. Uh, and within that project, uh, we created uh, tools that assessed the impact of uptake in energy efficiency uh, and compared it uh, to conventional reinforcement uh, and flexibility uh, procurement. With that uh, having been learned, uh, we've sort of calculated uh, a maximum ceiling price a, a DNO could uh, invest into an energy efficiency scheme. Uh, and now the underlying challenge is to either create or identify commercial models where DNO investment uh, is possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, so looking uh, behind uh, us and what we've uh, set out to achieve, uh, as I said, we aim to understand develop the, the commercial models DNOs could use uh, to fund uh, energy efficiency measures. And that was uh, undertaken through sort of primary and secondary research, looking at nationally and internationally at successful uh, energy efficiency schemes uh, that have been carried out with uh, some form of DNO uh, involvement. Uh, there were tools that were created in Defender that we've identified that needed to be um, evolved and just uh, changed uh, with updated uh, data and CMZ uh, data. Uh, and in doing this, uh, we've been able to create a, a set of long listing criteria for a potential uh, demonstrator uh, trial. And that includes inserting uh, new uh, variable metrics that gives a rough idea that it can be uh, realistic and scalable rather than just being a, a one-off uh, trial. We've also wanted to look at the Test the, the customer journey in uptaking energy efficiency and where DNOs could make a maximum impact uh, along that uh, pathway. Uh, and again, we've done that through primary and secondary research uh, along with our uh, local authority partners uh, as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so project Pioneer was broken down into four key work packages. Uh, so the first uh, work package, as I said, was looking at that um, defender tools that were created and scoping out uh, areas of development that is achievable within uh, the discovery period or uh, ones that can be addressed in the alpha period as well. That fed into our work package too, uh, where we carried out the long listing uh, locations. Our local authority partners uh, were Devon County Council and uh, the West of England combined authorities, who we traditionally looked within that, within their area, uh, and as to how much uh, to calculate the ceiling price for a DNO within that uh, area. In parallel uh, to that, uh, in work packages three and four, we looked at the uh, the potential uh, funding strategies uh, that DNOs uh, could uptake, and that uh, the outputs of that would feed into work package four, um, where we could identify the routes uh, DNOs to impact that uh, domestic customer uptake of energy efficiency. Uh, and currently, this is all feeding into the development of, of what can be uh, developed in, in alpha uh, phase. I'll now, now move on to um, Frontier Economics uh, uh, piece of work uh, and hand you over to uh, Alex Whitaker. So Alex, over to you. Thanks, Jacob. Um, yes, yeah, so as Jacob said, we, we've focused on work packages one and two, which are all about how you would identify the areas um, where you could trial DNO interventions. Just m moving on to the, uh, the next slide, please. What, what we mean um, by an intervention is effectively the DNO spending some money, and we'll, we'll go on in a minute to talk about how that money might be spent, in order to hopefully bring forward domestic thermal efficiency measures. And the ultimate objective of that for the DNO has to be to reduce costs, um, either through um, postponed reinforcement to the network, potentially also reduce flexibility costs. And so it's, it's only going to be viable for the DNO if you can hit that. Um, but there are also potentially some secondary benefits um, that we've looked at around reducing um, costs across the whole system and also there are potentially synergies with supporting customers in vulnerable circumstances. So we taking those ultimate objectives, we looked at what we would need uh, in order to pick an area or areas uh, for trialing these types of interventions. So the, the first criteria is we need them to be representative of the types of area um, that a business as usual scheme would eventually target. <clears throat> so there are only going to be certain parts of the country, certain types of properties uh, where benefits to DNOs of thermal efficiency are, are material. And so we want to ensure that we're targeting areas that are representative of those, those types of somewhat higher value properties and areas. At the same time, um, it, it'd be very useful within a trial to be able to work across a, a wide variety of property types um, you know, 
different tenure types, for example, as uh, determine what types of interventions work best for which types of properties. So we need to pick areas that have a sufficiently wide variety of property types. Very importantly, as Jacob alluded to, we, we don't want to pick an area that is so unique um, that you know, even if the, the trial scheme is success, it couldn't be rolled out more broadly. Uh, so for example, um, we, we found in our modeling, the, the eyes are silly, um, have you know, very sort of peculiar situations with regards to the, the reinforcement cost there, which would mean there's very, very high benefits to energy efficiency, but you know, clearly not comparable to other areas. We, we want to pick somewhere where the benefits are high, but not so high they can't be replicated. Um, and then also we need to ensure we're, we're picking areas for a potential trial uh, where you know, if, if the necessary local partners and supply chain are in place. So moving on to the next slide. So to do this, we've we built on the, the work carried out by Defender, uh, which was the, the previous NIA funded project, which looked at how you could integrate energy efficiency interventions into DNO's current processes. And we, we've used this for, for selecting the areas uh, for a potential trial, but the idea is that these sorts of tools uh, could be built on to enable DNOs to, to target um, areas and properties in any future business as usual scheme. And so what we've done is we've looked across all of the, um, the, the current or, or soon to be constrained areas uh, in the Southwest um, part of Engedge region. We've then developed a whole load of metrics which relate to, to those criteria on the previous screen. Uh, so you know, pr property mix, tenure mix, uh, factors which relate to, to how successful a scheme might be. And we've, we've removed areas which are kind of outliers and which are you know, qu quite unusual areas. It might be hard to draw comparisons from them in a, a trial um, and also areas that don't have um, sort of a wide mix of property types. Once we've done that, we've ordered the remaining areas by DNO ceiling price. Um, and so this, as, as Jacob was saying, this is effectively the, the highest amount which a DNO could pay for an energy efficiency scheme and still obtain benefits. And the, the key finding from uh, Defender, and it's re replicated with this work, it's, it's generally relatively low. Uh, and that's because you're, you're typically postponing reinforcement by a few years rather than meaning it will never happen. So in, in many areas, it's you know, a few pounds per property, but particularly in rural areas, that can be a bit higher, um, generally you know, up to a few hundred pounds or so. Um, and the, the, the nature of those areas and the, the level of that ceiling price has, has really strong influence on the types of schemes which are viable. We'll, we'll talk through that in a minute. Um, anyway, if we go on to the next slide, I'm just going to briefly hand over to Masao Carbon Chess, who will talk through some of the improvements that we've scoped in other areas of modelling. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, my slide doesn't have as pretty animations, but it's pretty much just a pause to say um, that also in Work Package 1, we were looking at how do we sort of improve the, the tools coming out of Defender from um, within the discovery phase in Pioneer, um, specifically around how do we pair the learnings um, at both a sort of household level and population level um, with the householder profiling tool that we use to see what is the benefit of heat pumps, how can we have sort of backup heating to sort of meet those um, winter peaks. Um, and then if we look at different analyses with the COP that we apply, particularly for heat pumps, do we get um, a better understanding of the retrofit level that may be needed across certain areas? And um, so some of the key findings that we found in that, and um, the, the tool has, within discovery, we, we scope the work that is needed in the tool. And, and right with Retrometer, we use a lot of the work with um, Hildebrand. Um, so we're looking at what do we have as a medium priority moving forward in, in discovery, and that's what we did. And these are the three priority areas that we really sort of focused on. Um, looking at the sort of load profiles for heat pumps, if we were to have that varying COP analysis with temperature, of course, we can use a flat COP, but that's obviously not representative of what happens. Um, but of course, how do we balance the sort of computational analysis needed with the temperature varying COP, getting some better results there? Um, we sort of better need to understand the extreme winter days and the impact that we have um, on typical sort of poorly insulated households and the peaks. Um, do they need to have backup heating, direct electric? Is that something that is going to then need 10 direct electric within a home, which is not really feasible? Is that sort of underlying some um, sort of representing some underlying modeling issues that we may need to work on further? Um, and that brings me to the, the last part, which is that we've 
with Hildebrand, we need to definitely get um, some more injection of their smart meter data. Um, like was said in the previous um, project with Retrometer, they have a great database there. Um, and we see that there's a lot of improvement for really getting diversity of households um, across sort of different levels of insulation to better represent what's happening at the household level and the network level. And um, back to you, Alex. Thanks, Marcel. Let's just go on to the next slide. And, and just to summarize the, the output of uh, work package two, this is a short list of um, areas where a, a trial could potentially be carried out. And so these, they, they fulfill the criteria that we've discussed, um, but they also, um, they, they differ in some various important dimensions. So some of these are off gas grid areas um, with a, a large amount of uh, so bottled gas or oil heating. Um, and the, the nature of an intervention, a trial could be quite different in those areas that they're, they're likely to uh, be moving over to heat pumps sooner, um, often sort of larger, less efficient properties. And so you can contrast those with some of the areas which are more on grid, um, potentially areas that, that you'd want to explore that would then um, potentially be uh, taking up heat pumps in greater volumes later on. The other Sort of main dimension in, in which they, they differ. And, and this came through the, the qualitative work uh, carried out with the, the partners on this project, the local authorities. Some, some of these areas, um, they have kind of very active local energy community groups um, that, that could potentially be leveraged as part of a scheme. Other areas don't, but then that might be useful for trials if you're trying to see if you can sort of catalyze that type of um, community action. Um, so that, that sort of summarizes work packages one and two, and I'll hand back over to Marcel to, to go through the, the scheme design itself. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Next slide, please. And um, so in work package three and four, what we're really trying to figure out is how do we get the funding right? So there's a lot of funding available, there are, um, a few tools as well at a government level to figure out if you're a homeowner in a certain um, area or at least nationally, what sort of funding applies to you as somebody considering a retrofit um, program. Um, but what we have found were there are a few gaps, particularly how does this bring value to the DNO specifically and what is the sort of business case that would best help the DNO sort of distribute the funds to enact a proven sort of retrofit activity, because that's the thing. You have to make sure that there's monitoring in place to ensure that the money that is spent um, to sort of foster these retrofit programs actually delivers in sort of measurable outcomes and impacts. Um, so there is a lot more value to sort of work as a DNO with the existing funding that's already in place. It's not necessarily like the DNO has the sort of financial mechanisms to sort of compete with, say, Nationwide's um, Green Mortgage Fund. Um, and it's not necessarily compete is the right word. It's just how do we complement existing funding streams um, to make sure that there's less duplication of effort as well as a more streamlined rollout of um, these systems. Uh, we also looked at um, retrofitting need to be sort of delivered at the sort of scale. So as Alex touched on, rural areas definitely present a lot more value, but it's not necessarily the areas where there's a lot of appetite. So we need to make sure that the retrofit um, advice, funding and services really are paired with places that will implement the, the programs. Um, the word that's commonly used or term is the sort of able to pay sector, um, and these are sort of households that are deemed as able to pay for retrofit programs and thus do not qualify for government funding per se, but they themselves still need an additional sort of financing mechanism to, in order to sort of trigger retrofit. Um, it's so some cases, depending on the areas, depending on the house archetype, um, there's significant work to be done and that comes with a cost. So even though you're able to pay um, in the government eyes, you may still not be able to financially enact that. Um, obviously, working with the local partners is really essential. And we have found out in sort of discovery that they, in if moving forward in Alpha, we definitely need to have the right people in place, whether from retrofit builders to the local authorities to really get these all rolled out. And obviously leveraging additional funding um, through verification, this is a point where there are some schemes already applied with such um, retrofit credits, per se, um, where enacting a sort of retrofit will give you certain credits that can be traded. There's certain schemes that are similar to sort of carbon trading that are quite interesting that we found that um, may help sort of um, invigorate um, the system. Next slide, please. 
I'm a bit conscious of time, so I won't spend too long on the next two, but simply just to say that the DNO obviously has a really key strategic decision points that they can um, enter, whether that is the project inception to really sort of tailor what a program should entail, um, the design of that program, uh, particularly one of interest is the connection application. So when you're connecting, can the DNO have a sort of uh, leveraging of saying what sort of flexibility and energy efficiency applications and technology should be put in place with your retrofit program to ensure maximum energy savings. And of course, as mentioned previously, there needs to be a level of performance and monitoring. Uh, next slide, please. The next two are quickly just to state that these DNO interventions can happen at different levels. There are four levels. The first two shown here are an enabler and advice services, and they determine the impact per property versus the reach of the intervention. You can see if the DNO plays an enabler sort of role within it, um, the system that they can have a wider reach. Um, because it's not like they're giving out funds to every single household involved in this. Um, but in the next slide, sorry. You can see if they then go to a funding retrofit program in very targeted areas, obviously the reach is not as large, it is quite um, specific to that certain area, but there's a lot more impact for property with the funding involved. Next slide. Uh, so I'll hand it over, I believe, to Cameron. Project. Thank you. So uh, unfortunately, Cameron's uh, unwell today, so I'll have to uh, take over from him. Uh, but yes, all now all the uh, work packages are pretty much uh, concluded. Uh, they currently uh, under review, uh, and we've held out a most sort of scoping uh, session over the last couple of weeks in terms of our flag activities uh, and what the potential work would look like there. And uh, now that's been uh, submitted uh, internally, we're going to uh, make a decision point now on whether to progress uh, with an alpha application, providing that there's uh, the correct uh, business justification uh, is there. Uh, and that's happening uh, this week. So by the, the end of this week, we should be able to uh, we'll have a, a route as to where we're going uh, next. I think that's all from us. So happy to move on to uh, Q&A now. Just, just a quick point there, Jacob, just to say that we have a meeting with Retrometer this week, so um, we're clearly trying to see how best the, the projects can come together. Yeah. Just a minute or so for um, a quick couple of questions. Um, so what do you see as the role for local authorities in this process? Um, Jacob, Alex, or shall I? Feel free to say yes. <laughs> Um, I think for me, it's um, a very strong one. I think the local authorities will have, they, they're definitely the, the knowledge holders of what's already happening, what funding is available, and how that funding differs um, regionally. Um, and I think they have foresight in terms of what's to come. So I think any project of this scale will fail without a local authority, um, and particularly a local authority that is already has sort of existing contracts with retrofit providers, which is key. That definitely, I, I think it's, it's that combination of local knowledge and, and potentially grants. What, one of the interesting things that, that came out of the, the mapping work is a lot, some of the constrained areas span across multiple local authorities. And, and so, you know, that's where potentially, you know, the, the DNO or, or others may be able to help linking them together and sort of giving, giving customers sort of a, a unified view because where things could be a little bit more complex. Right. And just one um, final question um, before we wrap up. Do we need institutional innovation to ensure, ensure energy efficiency, network planning, flexibility and electrification is coordinated? Um, I guess, yes. <laughs> That's a, a tough one to unwrap, but um, I would say yes. Uh, Jacob, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, can you repeat the, the question again? Uh, so uh, do, do we need institutional innovation to ensure um, energy efficiency, network planning, flexibility and electrification is coordinated? So potentially links on to that, um, that local authorities question. Uh, I, yes, uh, I would uh, say so. I don't I think I 100% uh, understand the question, but from in hindsight there, uh, yes, I think, I think. Yeah. I think that's where the DNO, sorry, Jake, I was just going to add, I think that's where the DNO has a, a sort of where we think could add the most value as that enabler to really bring together these different streams that may be coordinated differently if, if, if it weren't for the DNO to come together. 
Great. Uh, so I think that's all we have time for. There are other questions in that chat um, if you do want to go ahead and answer them. Um, I'd like to thank all our presenters today. Um, I know a lot of work goes into these presentations and um, we are very excited to see these projects develop through to alpha and beta stages. Um, so hopefully everyone can join this afternoon for um, our next session. And um, yeah, thank you for joining. Um, let's end of the presentation. <laughs>